So Dr. Tim Hannigan will now take the floor via Zoom. Dr. Hannigan is renowned for his academic publications that complement his rich travel experiences to the four corners of the globe. Uh, he has p published narrative history books as well as travel features for newspapers and magazines in the Middle East. Recording in progress. Yes, North America and Asia. One of his award-winning books include Raffles and the British Invasion of Java. Over to you, Dr. Hannigan. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much for, for having me here. It's, uh, it's, it's lovely to be back, not in person, unfortunately. Uh, remotely, I'm in the UK at the moment. I'm in Cornwall, which is where I'm originally from. But I, I, uh, at 7.30 in the morning, I'm trying to feel like I'm, I'm there with you. I've, I've not been in Singapore since uh, the year before COVID, so it uh, feels like a very long time. Um, I will just get my presentation shared here a second. Oops. I have uh, I've slightly changed the title, you'll notice, but I'm still very much in the same area as uh, as the the pressy in in the program um this this isn't isn't really a uh, it's not a research paper it's in a way a kind of a polemic but i've also taken the opportunity to um reflect really after some years more than a decade of thinking about reading about it and also writing about raffles um to to try and to try and think uh, where we might go next with the debates around raffles, which is what I've been particularly particularly engaged in um, since writing the book mentioned a little while ago, um, Raffles and the British Invasion of Java. Uh, it's it's off the back of that book that I get invited to talk about talk about things like this in Singapore. So I'm I'm thinking here uh, about what what possibly what possibly could be done next in that respect. Um, so that's uh, that's that's what I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, some years ago, as mentioned, I wrote a book called Raffles and the British Invasion of Java. It was originally conceived as a narrative history, an account of the five year period, 1811 to 1816, before Raffles ever came to Singapore, during which Britain usurped Holland as the rising colonial power in Java and other parts of what's now Indonesia. Uh, but it also, uh, almost by accident, the book served as a revisionist biography of Thomas Stanford Raffles, who headed the British Interregnum in Java, but is still generally best known for his later involvement in the establishment of the British port at Singapore. There have been many previous biographies of Raffles, all of which, all of which portrayed him as heroic, honourable, visionary, morally impeccable, though possibly rather boring person. The more recent of these books tended to present him as that rare thing, a notable figure of the British Empire still deserving straightforward admiration in a post-colonial era. The last colonialist it's okay to like, and the apparent popular veneration of Raffles in Singapore itself surely made this presentation easier. But researching the British period in Java, reading Raffles' own official and private correspondence and other archival material from the time generated for me an impression, an impression that was impossible to square with the image of the biographies. So my own book then became a reactive text. Um, and that's one of its problems. There are lots of things I would like to change about the book if I was to rewrite it now, but it became a reactive text, uh, an attempt as I saw it to set the record straight, a record that had somehow gone very badly awry in the previous two centuries. The book was launched uh, at the 2012 Singapore Writers' Festival. It just caught me realizing that that's now more than 10 years ago when I was preparing this, uh, this presentation. And quite by chance, it appeared at exactly the same time as another new biography, Raffles and the Golden Opportunity by the senior and very well-established British writer, Victoria Glendinning. Glendinning's book took the traditional positive line on Raffles, and I suspect she was quite understandably a little perturbed by the serendipitous appearance of my rival account. With an eye for manufactured controversy, the festival organizers decided to stick us together for what they build as an exclusive face-off entitled Raffles, Saint, Scoundrel, or 
dot, dot, dot. Glendinning elected to speak first, uh, reading a prepared paper. I had come expecting to debate rather than to present, so I didn't have a prepared statement. Rather unexpectedly, she began by dismissing the contemporary significance of Edward Said. When she was at university, she said, lots of people were very excited about a new book by Edward Said called Orientalism. It was very good, according to Glendinning, but very much of its time. We are now in the 21st century, she said, she said, and things have moved on. This did generate a certain frisson in the audience, which contained a good few humanities students and professors from Singapore's universities. And in the Q&A that followed, Glendon was challenged by an audience member on the alleged irrelevance of Saeed, and she did row back a little bit. And I chipped in to say that he absolutely was, and that even if he wasn't, when it came to literature and colonial history, it really wasn't for the likes of me and Glendinning, both white Britons, albeit from very different backgrounds and generations, to say so. But she was absolutely right in having latched onto Said in response to reading my account of Raffles. It's a, a narrative history book of the very populist, purplest sort, all overblown flowery language and dramatic reconstructions. It certainly doesn't contain any direct references to post-colonial theory. I, I should say at this point that um, I do have numerous regrets about that book. And um, one of them was that uh, rather naively, I didn't actually recognize that it might be quite a significant in intervention uh, on, on the perceptions of Raffles. So I wrote it very much just as a, as a narrative history book, a pop history book to be a, a good read. And then forevermore, I sort of received emails from people asking me where a particular source is, so I have to dig it out and asking me to sort of explain a, a particular bit. So if I was to do it again, I would certainly make it a lot more um, probably conventionally scholarly and robust in that sense, but then perhaps it might not have had so much of, a, of an impact, might not have caught people's attention. So, um, but yes, anyway. But if Glyndening suspected that Edward Said's ideas were floating around in there somewhere, particularly when I discussed Raffles' intellectual project in Java, the catalog of, cataloging of temples, accumulation of manuscripts, the gathering of ethnographic notes, which ran alongside the military and political endeavor, then she was spot on. As for many people, Edward Said was my introduction as an undergraduate to post-colonial studies and really to critical thought more generally. Two decades after the first publication of Orientalism, it was still an invigorating first encounter with the critique of ideas, the analysis of discourse, the argument, the texts, all texts are both political and interconnected. The sense that whenever a writer says something, it's worth asking why, where did that something come from? And I'm heartened to see another two decades on and now more than 40 years since Orientalism appeared that it's still having the same effect it was manifest by the organization of this conference, uh, which yeah, congratulations to, to Matthew and, and his colleagues. Uh, it's, it's a great, great thing to see. Still very relevant then and still a touchstone for my own work, even when it appears to have nothing to do with colonial or post-colonial history. I've just published a book about Cornwall, uh, which is where I'm from. Um, but if you were to read it, you might recognize somewhere, somewhere underneath the ideas that it deals with is Edward Said still. Um, I'll talk about Raffles now. Raffles is probably well enough known here for me not to need to press his career, but I do know that there are some people joining um, online from other parts of the world. So very, very briefly, uh, he was a, uh, he came to Southeast Asia, just thought about the, the concept of Southeast Asia, which didn't exist by that name at the time, but he came to Southeast Asia as a young clerk in the British East India Company, initially in Penang, then Malacca. Um, he, at a very young age of 30, was appointed the Lieutenant Governor of Java after Java and other Dutch possessions in what's now Indonesia were annexed by Britain um, as part of the Napoleonic Wars when Holland had been invaded by France. Uh, for five years, he headed the administration in Java. It was a chaotic, frequently violent, and financially ruinous affair. And he ended that period in semi-disgrace. Returned to Britain, um, somewhat rehabilitated, certainly as a scholar and received a knighthood and then returned to Southeast Asia to the much, much lesser post of governor of uh, Benkulu. In, uh, in Sumatra, which was a small British outpost. But from that base, he then 
um, became involved in uh, engineered the establishment of the first British port at Singapore, which is what he's he's widely remembered for today. So, so that's Raffles. But um, I would I would argue that the historical Raffles, especially in Java, is actually an almost perfect embodiment of Orientalism. Although he was actually operating well before the Victorian high watermark of Orientalism in Saeedian conception, but his career really epitomizes what Farish Noor, following on from Said, has called the militarized commercial academic enterprise of 19th century European and especially British colonialism. It had the violence, it had the aggressive military assaults on local polities characterized as chastisements, punishments for native insolence, violence with a deliberately performative quality designed, as Raffles himself put it, of his notorious attack on Jogja Carter in Java in 1812 to teach the local rulers a lesson. Uh, to show them who was boss. It also had the extractive commercial impetus, Raffles reforms, uh, which are often highlighted as his good, one of his good areas, were almost always ultimately intended to generate revenue and ultimately to channel wealth from Southeast Asia towards the metropole. Perhaps most significantly of all, his so-called scholarship was always part of the colonial knowledge project. Less uh, strictly objective accounting of an actuality than a textual construction of knowledge of a new actuality. As Noor and others have amply demonstrated, knowledge is power, Raffles once wrote, and in intercourse between the enlightened and the ignorant nations, the former must and will be the rulers. And of course, the knowledge that he's talking about is knowledge constructed on his own, on European terms. I am not, I'm always pains to point out a historian by training, and I do not call myself a historian. I always try to correct people when they do. My academic background is in literary studies. My enduring interest in Raffles, since writing the book all those years ago, is less about the historical figure himself than about another textual construction, the Raffles of popular imagination, the product of a biographical discourse, a 200 year process of repeated valorization and reiteration. And this Raffles, not the actual man, I would argue, is the one represented by the two statues that stand close to the Singapore River, one dating from the colonial 1880s, the other from the notionally post-colonial 1970s, but both significantly identical in form, if not in material or colour. At the time of his death in 1826, Raffles' reputation, particularly within colonial circles, was not particularly strong. He'd left Java in 1816 in semi-disgrace, and though he had gone on to receive a claim for his scholarship and his involvement in creating the new British settlement at Singapore, suggestions of overreach, incompetence and corruption still lingered. Obviously, that had all changed by the time the first statue was erected in 1887, and that was largely down to the efforts of Raffles' widow, Sophia. In 1830, just four years after his death, she had produced the Memoir of the Life and Services of Thomas Stamford Raffles, 800 page volume, which in line with biographical convention at the time was largely made up of Raffles own letters, and their replies arranged to form a coherent narrative and embedded in explicatory introductions and footnotes. Sophia was working with an explicit motive of reputational rehabilitation a desire to do her husband's memory justice, as she put it herself. She was obviously very selective about what she included. Since uh, Sophia Raffles' memoir, there have been around a, a, a dozen further Raffles biographies, beginning with Charles Demetrius Bulger's Life of Sir Stamford Raffles in 1897, when we really were at the high watermark of the British Empire and of Orientalism, followed by several others in the 1900s and 1920s, then Emily Hahn's Raffles of Singapore in 1946, Voluminous Raffles of the Eastern Isles by Zia Wurzberg in 1952, followed by a run of shorter biographies in the 50s and 60s. There was then a bit of a gap uh, before Nigel Barley's 1991 biography come travelogue, The Duke of Puddle Dock Travels in the Footsteps of Stanford Raffles, which is now republished as just in the footsteps of Stanford Raffles. Then Victoria Glendinning's Raffles and the Gold Opportunity in 2012. There have also been myriad shorter biographical texts from children's picture books to entries in travel guidebooks. And as mentioned earlier, virtually all of them present Raffles in exactly the same positive light, just as Sophia Raffles might have hoped. And despite contrary archival evidence, 
and the more critical take colonialism that, of, on colonialism that one might have expected of the later 20th and 21st century biographers. So how, how did this happen? There's another Saidian resonance here. Said wrote in Orientalism of it, the textual attitude that people adopt in certain situations. And this, I'm quoting from Said, talking of this, one is when a human being confronts at close quarters something relatively unknown and threatening and previously distant. In such a case, one has recourse not only to what in one's previous experience the novelty represent, resembles, but also what one has read about it. Said was talking specifically about travel and travel writing here, but the idea can be applied much, much more widely. But sticking with travel, um, the idea is that newly arrived and confronted by all the, the unknown complexities of a place that's new to you, the traveller is likely to fall back on a text, as Said says, because a place can, quote, always be described by a book, so much so that the book or text acquires a greater authority and use even than the actuality it describes. And this is absolutely central as a mechanism of Orientalism, of the, the ideas part of Orientalism. Even if the Orient ever existed, even if Southeast Asia ever existed as a discrete and readily demarcated unit of territory and block of human geography, in all its vastness, it was entirely beyond summation. But a textually constructed Orient, textually constructed on European terms, could very easily be contained within a book. So the book wins over the actuality every time. And the statements made in the earliest Orientalist texts about a particular aspect of the Orient are likely to be found repeated over and over and over in subsequent texts. This is not to say that Orientalist writers actively fabricated their narratives, and it's certainly not to say that they didn't honestly believe that they weren't basing their judgments on authentic empirical data or direct experience. A classic and apt example is what Said Hussein al Atas identified as the myth of the lazy native. So a colonial traveler arriving in Southeast Asia, those we just heard, we wouldn't be calling it Southeast Asia at the time, would probably already have read that the natives were incurably indolent. And so when they spotted a local man snoozing under a tree in the middle of the afternoon, they had evidence of that indolence confirmed by their own eyes. The fact that the man in question might have been up since before dawn digging a ditch and was sensibly taking a break during the hottest part of the day doesn't really enter into it. The traveller was probably still in bed at the time, so they didn't notice the work going on. And even if they did, it was less likely to make impression because it didn't resonate with the texts that they'd read. Again, the book wins. Something very similar has happened in Raffles' biographical discourse. Because Sophia's memoir had some of the characteristics of an archive, a collection of correspondence written by or to or about Raffles during his own lifetime. That's how biographers have often used it, despite the fact that it's highly partial and indeed partisan. And so the, the Raffles that most of the early biographers first encountered was Raffles exactly as Sophia wished him to be seen, heroic, visionary, selfless, moral. Um, even in this century, Victorian Glendinning has said that her own interest in Raffles began when her husband brought her a copy of Sophia's memoir home from a business trip. So once these biographers entered the unedited archive, the actual archive itself, where they well, may well find irrefutable evidence of Raffles behaving cruelly, avariciously, dishonestly, they're predisposed to take more notice of the equivalent of the man snoozing under the tree the bits that make Raffles look good. Uh, and this, this may not even happen at a conscious level, but it, it certainly does happen. I, I want to step aside from that biographical discourse for a few minutes now to look at one particular episode from the actuality of Raffles' career in Southeast Asia. And then I'll come back to the biographies to look at how that episode has been presented or not presented there. Several controversial aspects of Raffles' career have become much better known in recent years, in particular his sacking and looting of Jogjakarta and the so-called Banjamasin outrage, in which he shipped an unknown number of people from Java to south, southern Borneo, certainly hundreds as de facto slaves for his unsavoury friend and colleague Alexander Hare. But for me, the most significant is still relatively little, little known. The Palembang affair was actually my own first detailed encounter with uh, with the raffles of the of the archives. 
sorry, um, with the raffles of the archive. By pure chance, the first box I called up and dove into in the British Library when starting my own research contained the correspondence surrounding that episode. I'll do my best to give a brief account of what happened there now. In late 1810, before Java, before Singapore, Raffles was based in Raffles was based in Malacca as agent of the Governor General to the Malay States, laying the groundwork and conducting advanced research for a planned British invasion of Dutch territories in, in Indonesia. This was an offshoot of the Napoleonic Wars. France had first invaded and then annexed Holland, so Dutch territories overseas became, uh, became enemy territory for the British, hence their interest in invading what had been the, the nascent Dutch East Indies. Um, prior, prior to the Napoleonic Wars. Part of Raffles' groundwork involved initiating correspondences with sultans and rajas across the archipelago, some of them notional Dutch vassals, some of them wholly sovereign. And these included Sultan Mahmud Bajuddin of Palembang, Mahmud Bajuddin II. Palembang's estate in southern Sumatra, which included two large islands in the Straits, Banka and Belitung, home to a long established tin mining economy, which Raffles knew all about. For nearly a century, the Sultanate had had a treaty with the Dutch authorities in Batavia, it's modern Jakarta, and the Dutch maintained a trading post at, Palem, at the Palembang capital on the Musi River, home in 1810 to about 100 Dutch citizens. The treaty meant that the Sultan, in theory, acknowledged Dutch suzerainty, but in practice, Palembang continued to function as an autonomous archipelago state. In late 1810, Raffles had a messenger carry his first letter from Malacca to the Sultan, in which he wrote, thus, I lose no time in dispatching this letter to put your majesty on your guard against the evil machinations of the Dutch, a nation that is desirous of enriching itself with the property of your majesty, as it has done with that of every prince of the East, which has had connection. I recommend your majesty drive them out from your country at once. If your majesty had, has reasons for not doing so and is desirous of the friendship and assist, assistance of the English, I have power over many ships of war and I think it proper to do it. I can drive the Dutch out where they 10,000 in number. He kept on uh, on the same theme in subsequent letters, telling the Sultan that the Dutch were a bad nation and a people of a sinister disposition, a want of faith and a rapacious spirit of aggrandizement, and repeatedly urging him to break his treaty arrangements and evict the occupants of the Dutch trading post. He even sent an unsolicited draft treaty to the Sultan, stating that his majesty, the Sultan hereby engages to dismiss from his territories the present Dutch resident and all persons acting under the authority of the Dutch government, and explaining that the Sultan needed to do this because Britain was probably going to invade Java. And if Palembang wanted to be truly independent, it needed to break with the Dutch before that ever happened. Otherwise, it would be automatically transferred to Britain and there'd be nothing Raffles could do about it. So it was all for Palembang's own good, apparently. Raffles even sent the Sultan a shipment of guns to assist with the eviction process. Bajardine himself didn't really have a problem with the Dutch. So he ignored the treaty and politely fobbed Raffles off, insisting that while Batavia is not taken, as this might occasion some distress to his majesty, the Hollanders shall remain to occupy the compound in, in Palembang. He was in a very awkward position. He had somebody sort of telling him, we're going to invade, so you need to, you need to break. But I mean, he had no guarantee that the invasion would, would happen or that the British would win. So he quite sensibly prevaricated. However, uh, he eventually, after many months of back and forth, got news that the British really had invaded Java and that Raffles had been appointed Lieutenant Governor there. And at this point, quite logically, Bajardine decided he'd better do what Raffles had asked if he was to have a friendly relationship with the British. And he should probably also try and make it look like he'd done it some time ago, seeing as Raffles had been asking for him to do it before Britain ever invaded Java. Exactly what happened is unclear, but the net result, predictably enough, was that all the Dutch citizens in Palembang were killed, probably on the 14th of September 1811, which was just three days after Raffles' appointment as Lieutenant Governor in Java, and it was actually before the final Dutch surrender there, which means that Bajanin had done exactly as Raffles asked. He'd evicted the Dutch before Britain formally seized Java. Nobody noticed that final point at the time. 
Of course, when Raffles himself found out what had happened, he didn't send a thank you note to Patrodine for his compliance. He fulminated about his abhorrent deeds and dispatched a punitive force, which chased Badgerdine out of his court, placed his brother on the throne as a British vassal, directly annexed the tin-rich islands of Banquet and Belletung, which we can confidently say was the plan right from the start. Long before he found out about the massacre of the Dutch, Raffles boss, Lord Minto, the governor general in India, had been writing, quote, Palembang is to be occupied as soon as possible. With regard to Banker and the Tin, the Lieutenant Governor Raffles knows my sentiments. And they wanted the islands ideally to be seized from a sovereign Asian state rather than from a Dutch signatory because that would allow Britain to keep them forever, even if Britain and Holland eventually made peace. Didn't work out as planned, they did go back to Holland in the end. This is all a matter of fact, it's evident, evidenced by archival sources, but it's also, I think, very, very revealing of Raffles' modus operandi as a political figure in Southeast Asia. Palembang is really the first significant local court that he deals with closely, and those dealings are transparently Machiavellian. Quite staggeringly so, in fact. He tries forcefully to incite the Sultan to a course of action, and then when the Sultan does what he asks, he uses that very action as an excuse to unleash violence and to remove the Sultan from his throne, to annex the most valuable chunk of his territory. And he's entirely cavalier about the likelihood of people, both Asian and European, losing their lives in the process. This is a pattern that repeats in the years that follows. It's exactly how Raffles deals with Jogjakarta in Java in 1812, but, but also Bali and Bone and Chiribon and Banten. Across his five years in, in Java, there's these episodes of violence where Raffles begins to talk to and, and, then, and then brings down brings down military fire on local courts. Archipelago courts in the era were well networked. And by 1819, I think we can reasonably assume that Raffles' reputation was fairly well known throughout the region amongst those courts, amongst the rulers. The idea that it was probably bad news if you started getting letters from Thomas Stanford Raffles was, I imagine, relatively widespread, that it might end up with sepoy soldiers destroying your palace. And so that, that iconic moment traditionally presented as the founding of Singapore, when Raffles and Farkas step ashore and meet the Temungong on the 29th of January, 1819, and then still more so the moment a week later, on the 6th of February, when they signed their treaty with Hussein Shah, should be understand, understood as an act of latent violence, a latent violence which I'd suggest everyone present at the time, very much including Hussein Shah and Temungong, fully recognised. But you don't find that discussed in any of the Raffles biographies. In uh, Sophia Raffles' memoir, we, we do find an account of the British advance on Palembang, but there's no mention of Raffles' motives there, nor excerpts from his correspondence with the Sultan. And that sets the tone. When we get to the next biographer, Bulger, we're told simply that Badruddin had acted, quotes, for some reason that cannot be confidently explained, and that Raffles had then dispatched a fleet to, quotes, bring the Sultan to a proper sense of his position. Chastise him. Many subsequent biographers don't mention Palembang at all, and only Wurzburg makes, makes brief reference to Raffles' correspondence with Badruddin from Malacca, correspondence which we're told was to have unexpected repercussions. Though without any summary of its contents or of Raffles' own purpose, annexing the Tin Islands in starting the correspondence in the first place. Morris Collis's 1966 biography, the whole episode is covered in a single line about an unnamed Sultan in Sumatra who had massacred the Dutch. And so it continues right the way down to Victoria Glendinning, who in the first instance simply says without explanation that Badruddin had ordered the massacre of a Dutch garrison and that Raffles was outraged when he found out. Some of these biographers will surely have looked into that same box file that I first examined in the British Library, been exposed to the same evidence. But operating within a discourse, falling back on the earlier biographic image of Raffles to which they've been exposed and which they themselves were in the process of reiterating, they didn't think it was significant or they decided not to tell people about it, or they simply couldn't process it within their own conception of Raffles. But look over there, there's a man asleep under a tree. Every so often I happen upon another biographical text that I previously missed and feel that old sense of bafflement and, and outrage. How did this happen? And then, of course, Saeed helps me to understand. 
These texts, uh, ones that I keep discovering, are often what we might call minor biographies, briefer accounts of raffles within larger texts or self-contained in shorter forms. Several years ago, I came across a, a 2002 graphic novel illustrated by Zhao Yimin, Stanford Raffles, founder of modern Singapore. This book was produced by a Singapore publisher. It's essentially hagiographic and unwavering in its adherence to the narrative originated by Sophia Raffles in her memoir. Raffles was from a poor family and he learned to speak Malay at a time when few other English officials could speak the language, things which are, are plainly untrue. And that's just on the cover blurb of the book. And there's no mention of violence he unleashed in places like Palembang and George Jakarta, of course. More recently, uh, browsing in a secondhand bookshop, I found, where did I put it? I had it lying around somewhere. Ah, I, I put it aside somewhere. Uh, a, a book called The Lost Temple of Java by Phil Grabsky, produced in 1999 to accompany an episode of the BBC history series, Time Watch, about Borobudur, the eighth and ninth century Buddhist temple in central Java, which Raffles is often miscredited with discovering. The book is effectively a brief biography of Raffles, as well as an account of Borobudur. We're told, amongst other things, that Raffles was always motivated by the general good. His desire to improve living conditions in Java motivated him to press on with introducing vaccinations, reducing the flow of opium and improving health care. He also prohibited from the beginning of 1813 an importation of slaves into Java. The part about opium is really not true at all. And the part about slavery is really just spin. Raffles was simply and belatedly putting into practice what was already since 1807 supposed to be a universal British in interdiction on the trade in slaves. And under Raffles, it was a very patchy prohibition. For a start, he exempted children from the ruling, allowing those under 14 to still be imported as slaves to Java. The buying and selling of slaves between Europeans and Batavia continued unabated. Even the official British government newspaper there carried adverts for domestic slaves on its front page. And Raffles himself was served by a large retinue of slaves at his official residences. And then, of course, there's the Banjo Masson outrage. But of course, neither the Asia Pac comic nor the BBC book make any mention of Palembang. It's important to realise exactly why that is, if we're to recognise how pernicious a discourse like that around Raffles can be. It's very unlikely that the authors of either of these two books did much or any original archival research. They drew their own account of Raffles entirely from secondary sources, mostly other biographies, which themselves were mostly follow-ons from Sophia's memoir. They therefore had no direct contact with the matter of history, the traces left by the actual Thomas Stanford Raffles for our analysis. They had contact only with the very textual construction to which they in turn contributed, a perfectly tuned feedback loop. They didn't mention Palembang, not because they were trying to cover it up, but because they knew nothing about it. Within the feedback loop, it simply never happened. And that applies to other textual discourses, other aspects of Orientalism, certainly. And with that in mind, I want to end by asking if we can ever actually move on from this situation, if there's anything we can do about it. Just a couple of weeks ago, I spotted in the BBC radio listings that Raffles was to be discussed on a show called Great Lives. My heart sank. Surely not. Still in 2023. Happily, however, production and research seems to have become more nuanced at the BBC since the Time Watch documentary in 1999. In this much more recent show, Raffles' proposer as a great life, Matthew Gould, CEO of the Zoological Society of London, which Raffles co-founded after his time in Asia, was offset by a thoroughly critical voice, Stephen Murphy, now of SOAS in London, but formerly of the Asian Civilizations Museum, heavily involved in some of the bicentennial activities around Raffles in 2019. Murphy did a really excellent job of intervening whenever hagiography threatened, questioning Raffles' alleged anti-slavery credentials, critiquing his scholarship, and even mentioning the Banjo Masson outrage which seldom gets an outing. But listening to the show did confirm for me a slowly emerging frustration uh, and a slowly emerging sense that I'm part of the problem, therefore a wish perhaps for my own irrelevance in this area. To be clear and to be fair, there have been critical voices speaking against the dominant discourse on Raffles for a very long time. He had critics amongst his own British contemporaries, some of who were critics on, on ethical grounds. There was also a strong anti-Raffles line amongst Dutch historians of the later 19th century, a line which itself was 
partisan and colonialist, but from, from the, the other team. But perhaps most significantly for us, in 1971, Said Hussein Al-Atas published his scholarly account, Thomas Stanford Raffles, Schema or Reformer. During my own first research on Raffles, it was a great relief to encounter this book, to feel that I wasn't alone. Al-Atas, who was an important part of that first generation of post-colonial scholars, along with Said himself, outlined the Palembang Affair, the Banjo Massin outrage, and various other episodes long ignored by Raffles' conventional biographers and still ignored by those who came afterwards. Uh, and towards the end of the book, which is a very short book, he wrote that it's hoped that the portrayal of Raffles' thoughts and actions in this book will be considered as an attempt to correct the persistent historical canonization of Raffles as a lovable and gentle personality surrounded by jealous competitors, as an heroic reformer who wanted to bring peace and progress to the people of the area in which he operated. There is a great need to review the entire historical writing in this region with a view to accomplish a deeper and more meaningful and objective portrayal of history. Al Attis's own answer to the titular question was clearly schema, and that will be my answer too. But half a century has now passed since Al Attis's book, and 11 years since mine, and I sometimes fear that we're still trapped in a simple and crude binary, a never ending debate. A schema or reformer? asked Al Attas. Saint or scoundrel? asked my debate with Victoria Glendinning. Hero or villain? asked the media at the time of the bicentennial. Great life or, or not great life, asked the BBC just the other day. So to be clear, the fact that there are still people out there who would fairly uncritically in the first instance consider him a great life worthy of straightforward admiration does mean that continuing to research and draw attention to, for example, the Palembang affair is a worthwhile endeavour. But I'd like eventually, sometime soon, for that no longer to be the case. In the last decade or so, the parts of the ongoing conversation around Raffles that I've actually found most interesting and invigorating are less the continuing scholarly work, although there's some great stuff there, than some of the creative explorations, particularly those emerging from within Singapore. Alfian Saat and Yao Hai Bin's 2019 play Merteka, which is written for and staged in the bicentennial year, was both a creative performance and a direct critical engagement with the histori historiography around Raffles. It's a powerful effect. It's, um, it was a brilliant show. Jimmy Ong's artwork has very, very much foregrounded what we might call the nasty bits of the Raffles story, but in subtle and subtly subversive ways. And there's much more too. One of my favorites is a poem called Effigies by Yi Xing. Uh, Yi Xing has produced some serious and sustained creative responses to Raffles and lots of other great creative work, serious creative work too, and also some solidly critical commentaries too. So I can only apologize to him for citing one of his more flippant works, but I do like it. It was posted online for Singapore Poetry Writing Month in 2018. It was inspired by a bizarre children's picture book by Janet Appleyard, published in 1992, called Raffles Finds a Friend, in which the two Riverside statues come to life and go on jolly japes around the nocturnal city, also providing yet another standard hagiographic biography of the man in the process. But in Yi Xing's version, things take a very X-rated turn and the statues end up in bed together at the Raffles Hotel, of course. The poem, which is mostly completely unquotable here, ends with bronze and polymarble in a state of post-coital bliss, while, these are the final lines, elsewhere in moonlight stand their pedestals, blissfully empty. And that line, of course, is suggestive and provocative, much more so than the hilarious X-rated stuff above it. I like the poem because it's consciously intertextual, it's a direct reaction to Raffles find a friend, finds a friend, but also because it's directed specifically at the statues, which are in turn, as I've already suggested, a representation of the textually constructed image of Raffles rather than the historical man. And this, of course, begs the question of what should really be done about the statues. When in 2020, protesters toppled a statue of the slave trader, Edward Colston, into a dock in Bristol in the UK. Various jokes were made about the unease the raffle statues must be feeling, given how close they are to the river. And there certainly have been voices arguing that raffles too must fall. But if we push him into the river of infamy, somebody will immediately start arguing for his restoration to the pedestal of heroism. I think it might ultimately better 
be better for us to reach a point where we simply stop talking about him. For the statue not to be toppled, but to be made smaller, figuratively or actually, through scholarship with its focus elsewhere, through creative work that both diminishes Raffles' traditional stature and embiggens other things, making the statues so small that we might walk right past without ever noticing them. Now again, I'm, I'm talking figuratively in the first instance, but if someone successfully pro proposes doing that actually, then yeah, why not? And when it comes time for the 250 year acknowledgement of the establishment of a British presence in Singapore, no one will feel the need to organize a debate or to deliver a conference paper on the question of whether Raffles is a schema or a reformer, a hero or a villain. Things really, really will have moved on. Um, and at that point, I'm going to stop talking about Raffles. Thank you very much for listening to me. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hannigan.